If you're in a church that celebrates Lent, you know that this week was the celebration of Ash Wednesday, and so this Sunday is going to be the first Sunday in Lent. And the, the gospel reading that many churches have on the first Sunday in Lent is the temptation of our Lord, which is recorded in Matthew and Mark as well as Luke. So what I want to do is talk about the temptation narrative from the perspective of the Old Testament, just like I've done with all these other videos. And this one, just kind of like the, like the last one, the Transfiguration, this one is just riddled through with Old Testament references. In fact, Jesus himself quotes the Old Testament three times in the temptation narratives. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack the, the multiple layers of the temptation account from the perspective of its Old Testament background. So we're going to follow along, especially with Matthew, as well as Luke, and we're going to also pull in a little bit of Mark as well. So what I want to say up front is that you, you, you kind of have to picture the temptation account of Jesus as a triptych, that is a, a three-paneled picture with the temptation of Jesus in the middle, and then on one side you have the temptation of Adam and Eve, that narrative, and then on the other side you have the, the narrative of Israel in the wilderness, because it's these two Old Testament narratives, Israel in the wilderness and Adam and Eve, which form the counterpart to everything that happens to Jesus. So you kind of have to keep all three of these images in mind, all three of these stories in mind, when you're reading about the temptation of Jesus. So we're going to kind of jump back and forth between these three, but we're especially going to focus upon Israel's time in the wilderness, because I think that is the template, the model, uh, by which the evangelist told about the temptation of Jesus. There's a, there's a back and forth between these two stories. So first of all, you got to keep in mind that there are, uh, in, these, in these three stories, that in each of these, you have a son of God that's present. Because Adam is called the son of God. In fact, Luke, when he finishes the genealogy of Jesus at the end of Luke 3, calls Adam a son of God, or the son of God. That is, it's it, it, God's child. And then, of course, Israel is called God's son, his firstborn. So Israel also is called a son of God. But then you have Jesus, who is the Son of God, the one who is of one essence with the Father, the one who is truly the Son of God, as Psalm 2 calls him. So you have, joining these three stories, the language of a Son of God. Adam is a Son of God, and Israel is a Son of God, and Jesus as the Son of God. Now, on the Adam side of this story, you have... A contrast that takes place because Jesus is, is led out into the wilderness to be tempted and Adam is tempted in paradise itself. And so right from the beginning, we have this contrast set up that's part of the story because Adam in paradise is tempted and yet gives in, even though he's in the midst of plenty. He has everything that he needs and still he gives in. Jesus, on the other hand, has fasted 40 days and 40 nights and still he does not give in to the temptation of Jesus. So as the church fathers often said, we gain more in Christ than we lost in Adam. So he not only does better than Adam does, he not only repeats what Adam did and does it perfectly, but he gives us abundantly more than what we lost in Adam. So you have that part of the story. Then you have Israel. Israel was in the wilderness. They were in the wilderness for 40 years, and that, of course, is a tie-in with the 40 days and the 40 nights that Jesus was in the wilderness himself, fasting. So Israel's in, there in the wilderness 40 years. That's a counterpart to Jesus being in the wilderness 40 days and 40, 40 nights. But there's also something else because as it turns out, there's only two people in the Old Testament who fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, Moses and Elijah. Elijah did it in imitation of Moses. So you have these two Old Testament prophets. And if you, if you remember from the last video, both of them, Moses and Elijah, were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So their stories once more connect with the story of Jesus here because he is the prophet of prophets, the one who comes to fulfill perfectly the prophetic office. And so Moses fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Elijah fasting 40 days and 40 nights becomes the model that Jesus himself follows as the prophet of prophets as he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. So we kind of have the scene set between these three stories. Now what happens next? Well, the devil comes to Jesus after, after he's fasted, and the first temptation is for him to turn stones into bread. And Jesus responds by quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, as I've said before, when an Old Testament verse is quoted, you can't just look at that particular verse because that verse is a window into a broader context. And this broader context is significant because if you look at about 
I don't know, the first five or six verses of Deuteronomy chapter 8, one of which Jesus quotes. We have the whole framework set up because God says that he took Israel into the wilderness for 40 years. That's a time with the 40 days and 40 nights. And then we have the quote that Jesus himself refers to, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And then at the end of this section in Deuteronomy 8, it says that the Lord was testing Israel as a father disciplines his son. So we have the 40 days, we have the quote, and we have the father-son language, all compressed into those first few verses of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Moving on. Temptation number two. The devil takes Jesus upon the pinnacle of the temple and says, fall down, because, jump down, because as the psalm says, God will give his angels charge concerning you so that they will bear you up and you won't strike your foot against a stone. Now, in this particular case, Jesus responds once more with the biblical text, Deuteronomy chapter 6, just a couple of chapters before his response to the first temptation. And this one is very significant because Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, if you look at the context in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the verse goes on to say, as you did at Massa. Okay, now jump from Deuteronomy 6 back to the story of Massa in Exodus chapter 17. Massa means test or testing. And what happened was Israel was thirsty they were in the wilderness, and they were complaining to Moses, as they did all the time. And so God commands Moses to take his staff and to walk in front of the people with the elders and then to go to a rock and to strike the rock. And God is going to be standing on top of Mount Sinai while this happens. Now think about what's going on. The devil quotes this psalm verse, trying to tempt Jesus to jump down from, the, from the, the, top, the top of the temple. Jesus, as it were, says, you know what? I'm glad you said something about striking a stone because that reminds me of a story from the Old Testament where Moses was to strike a stone and God was standing on top of a mountain while this took place. And this place was where the Israel put God to the test, Masa. And on the basis of this, Deuteronomy says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as at Masa. So forget about your psalm verse, which you've taken out of context anyway, Satan. What I'm going to refer to is what happened in Israel's history at Masa, when they put the Lord God to the test and God disciplined them accordingly. Now, third temptation. The devil takes Jesus up to a very high mountain, it shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, if you'll bow down to me, then I will give these to you. And of course, Jesus responds once more now from Deuteronomy chapter 6, in which he says that you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, in that particular context, if you look at the next verse in Deuteronomy 6, after the one that Jesus quotes, there's a reference made to the gods of the nations surrounding Israel, that they are not to bow down to them. And this corresponds with what happens with Jesus on the very high mountain, which the devil says, bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. So he's showing him all these nations with their gods. And so Jesus responds by quoting the verse that he does, because in that verse, God prohibited worship of any gods except him alone. Now, look at the big picture of what's happening here. The reason that Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6 twice and Deuteronomy 8 once which refer back to earlier incidents in the life of Israel, is because what Jesus is doing here is he's recapitulating the life of Israel. He's not only going back through the same process they went through, traveling the same lands, undergoing the same temptations, but he is going to now do so faithfully and perfectly because he is Israel reduced to one. And so what they went through, he's now going to go through. He's going to tr retrace their footsteps as the one man Israel so that where they failed, he will succeed. Where they were unfaithful, he will be faithful. And in this way, fulfill the law for us. And in the broader narrative context, when does this happen to Israel? This happens to Israel after their baptism in the Red Sea, then they enter the wilderness for 40 years. This incident in the Gospels happens after Jesus' baptism in the Jordan, then he enters the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. So 
you have three narratives. You have Adam and Eve, you have Israel in the wilderness, and you have the temptation of Jesus. And there's there's parallels between all three of these. All the, the two Old Testament stories provide the backdrop for the temptation of Jesus. He's the new Adam. He's the new Israel. He's the one who comes to do for us what we couldn't do on our own, what Adam couldn't do, what Israel couldn't do, where they were unfaithful. He is faithful so that his righteousness, his keeping of his father's word might be credited to us so that in him, we too might become the children of God, the sons and daughters of our father and the brothers and sisters of Jesus. So the gospel for this Sunday the good news for this Sunday is it's not so much that Jesus is giving us an example and showing us how to overcome temptation. I'll grant that that might be a side issue, but the main story, the good news is that we in Christ have overcome temptation because what he did in the wilderness, he does for all of us so that his righteousness is now credited to us. So that's the Old Testament background of the temptation of Jesus from Adam and from Israel, now coming to its fulfillment in the life of Christ for us. Thanks for listening.